Okay, uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a little bit past three o'clock in uh, in Amsterdam or in Hilversum, where I'm at. Um, welcome to another hybrid hot politics lab. Um, today, I'm uh, very happy to uh, to host uh, Professor Alan Stanfi from uh, University of uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen, um, and. Uh, I, the first time I, I heard about uh, about uh, about Alan is uh, is via Martin Rosema, who uh, who is uh, uh, I think one of uh, maybe one of the earliest political psychologists in uh, the Netherlands, and and he told us about a very exciting project uh, that he started with Alan uh, uh, on on how uh, uh, people process political information, and uh, and this is also how uh, how we learned about uh, or I I at least learned about some of uh, of Alan's uh, Alan Senfi's work work uh, which is really I think uh, cutting edge in in a sense that uh, that that it uh, it combines insights from various disciplines uh, uh, neuroscience economics to understand how people make uh, their decisions uh, um, Alan has been at Princeton at the University of Arizona and uh, in Nijmegen has got a numerous prestigious grants such as near starting grant and uh, and really has done a, a variety of really interesting uh, studies on uh, on understanding how uh, how, how people make uh, their decisions. And I'm really happy that you're here uh, today to uh, to share some of your ongoing work with us. Uh, so, Alan, uh, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bert, for that uh, kind introduction. And, uh, well, it's very nice to be here. Um, my research has taken me all over the, the map a little bit. So this is my first experience with a, with a politics lab, hot or otherwise. So... Um, I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit of what we do here and, and, and hopefully also get some, some feedback from you as to you know, how we think perhaps these disciplines could, uh, could usefully um, um, have conversations. So I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen here. Um, is there something PowerPoint-like there? Okay, great. Thanks. So, <clears throat> so my background is in, as Bert says, is in, in uh, neuroscience um, and psychology. So I'm a cognitive neuroscientist interested in, in decision making. So interested in understanding the mechanisms and processes uh, of our decisions and choices. And uh, we're particularly interested in decisions and choices which are uh, social in nature uh, and which have a, a potentially societal impact. So what I wanted to do today was just talk in kind of briefly about two studies, um, which will hopefully give you a sense of, of what we do and how we do it. And the latter study of which is actually the culmination of um, the work uh, Bert mentioned with, uh, with Martin, um, where the, the data is super fresh. If, if I was there, you'd be able to smell the freshness of it. Um, so it's very much a work in progress, but it would be, it, it's nice to get a chance to present it to you guys and, and hopefully get some useful feedback. So the, the way we think about the decisions is that, you know, we have all of these decisions we need to make every day and they can be very mundane decisions um, to very consequential decisions, but they're really key, I think, to our kind of our health and well-being. And understanding these choices is important from the perspective of both um, scientific interests that we, we like to know what are the mechanisms underlying the decisions, but I think they also have really important uh, public policy relevance. And I'll talk a little bit this um, about this at the end if I have time. But I think our you know policymakers are insufficiently informed as to these decision mechanisms when trying to enact uh, public policy, especially around things like uh, affect. Um, and motivation so but maybe i'll talk about it later but that, that's kind of inspired some of our work which we try to look at decisions that are at least uh you know we, we want to do experimental work that's where we do our work in the lab but we want the, the the decisions we have our participants make be somewhat representative of the type of complex decisions we're often faced with in the in the real world so uh, we we use a lot of different methods uh, to uh, try and assess these decision processes. These are just a few of the ones we use. I'll talk about, uh, I think, three of these today. So obviously, you know, we're, we're interested in individual variation, and this can be individual variation of, of, of cognitive or affective or motivational skills, but also variation across culture, uh, age, gender, and so on um, is very interesting to us. Uh, we use uh, brain imaging, so predominantly functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, 
where we can kind of uh, observe the brain as it's engaged in making decisions. And this is really helpful for us to try and constrain our models of decisions uh, by what's actually happening. So what's physically possible. So we don't just have a, a, a black box saying something magical happens here, but we try and uh, understand it in the context of neural processes. Uh, we've done quite a lot of work with hormones and genetics looking at how different kind of hormones and testosterone, serotonin, oxytocin, for example, can shift their decision profiles. And one, one aspect that's really important is that we uh, make every effort to try and quantify our decision-making models and hence the kind of modeling uh, component here where we're very inspired by models, both from economics and also from uh, computational neuroscience where we try to be quite specific about what we mean by a decision process. Um, uh, so, and I'll give some examples of that as we go through. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, difficult to do because um, mathematical modeling, uh, you know, uh, is a simplification, of course, of what's going on. But uh, we feel it's important because it, it nails our colors to the mass, so to speak, uh, and gives us a way of testing our models against uh, com com competing accounts. So um, what I want to talk in the time I have today is, is experiments, as I said, tried, that we tried to look at, which are inspired by real world decisions and choices. And I'll talk about two sets of studies today in brief, and I'm happy to talk more in the discussion. So one is looking at moral motivation. So what motivates us to make moral uh, pro-social decisions? So what are the psychological and neural factors that underlie our, our motivations? And then I will talk uh, briefly um, with, about some new data we have on the political messaging and polarization studies uh, that Bert talked about that we've done in, in combination with Martin um, in Twente. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, again, is, is an illustration of the way we approach the, the problems and the kind of methods we employ and the conclusions we think we can reach. So this is work with uh, Jeroen van Baar, who uh, was a PhD student in my lab up until a couple of years ago. And here we're interested in uh, reciprocity and pro-social choices. So we're interested in essentially, why do we return favors when we don't have to? Um, uh, Bert gives me a nice kind introduction and perhaps in the future I'm introducing Bert and I might feel some moral obligation to give him a nice kind introduction too. But of course I don't have to, nobody's forcing a gun to my head and telling me to be nice. I can just say, you know, here's Bert, let's listen to him. And uh, you know, there's no consequence to that. But often we feel this necessity to uh, reciprocate nice acts of another, right? And this is known uh, as an economic puzzle. It's perhaps only a puzzle to economists as to why we do this. Um, we all, I think, have a good sense of why we, we actually engage in this behavior. Um, but there's not that many, I think, well-specified models trying to understand the motivations of uh, reciprocity. So that's what we set out to do in this study here. Now, the way we measure reciprocity in the lab is we use a trust game. I'm going to show you this here just as an illustration of the kind of tasks we use to elicit our decisions and to, and to study the choices that people make. So in the trust game, it's a two player game. And the, these games are usually played for real with real people and with real money. So you and Peter are in the lab together. I'm, I give Peter 10 euro as an additional endowment. And Peter is told he can transfer some money to you. And whatever he transfers to you is going to be quadrupled by me, the experimenter. He's in a sense investing in you. So let's imagine Peter makes the following decision. Right? He's going to give eight to you. He keeps the remaining two for himself. He gives eight to you. That's going to be quadrupled by me. And so you uh, end up with 32 euro. Okay, so that's part one of the trust game that Peter is trusting some of this money with you. The second part of the trust game is the reciprocity part. And in the second part of the trust game, you have a decision to make. And it's a very simple decision. You're simply asked, how much of this 32 euro do you want to return to Peter? Now you can do anything you want here. You can say, you can give it all back to Peter. So he has 34 and you have nothing. You can uh, keep it all for yourself. Uh, there's no, nothing stopping you running away, taking the 32 euro and saying, you know, thanks a lot, Peter. Um, you can give him some proportion back or whatever. So, but in a sense, what we're measuring here, we believe is, is reciprocity. Peter has, uh, Peter knows the rules of the game. He's kind of, he understands that, uh, you can both do better if he could transfer his money to you because of this multiplier factor. Uh, but he's trusting you, presumably, to do the right thing. Right? He doesn't just want you to abscond with the money. And so we can look at then at the degree to which you reciprocate some of that 32 euro when you don't have to as some measure of reciprocity um, of your motivation to repay Peter for his uh, trusting act. 
So this is a very well established game. We've done this, you know, thousands of times. On average, people return about half of their uh, endowment. So usually people will send back 16. You can all look deep into your souls and see what you do to Peter in this case. But um, usually it's about 16. Um, and so we've been interested in what, what's, why this is the case. Now, the standard explanation from economics is this uh, so-called warm glow effect, that I give money to Peter because it makes me feel good and Peter feels good and everybody feels good and the world is, is happy after I reciprocate. But after you know, seeing hundreds of participants come out of this experiment, they very rarely seem very happy to have given money to Peter. They kind of grudgingly do it. They know they're, it's the, they're, they kind of feel they're supposed to do it. They feel some pressure to do it. Um, so it doesn't seem that this warm glow account really holds up. So what could it be? Well, there's a couple of potential uh, explanations that have been put out there. One is the notion of equity, that people don't like unequitable outcomes. I don't want me to have 32 and Peter to have two. So I'm going to give him money because it's the kind of right thing to do. It's the right thing that we should share in the resources. Uh, a competing uh, explanation is expectation. And this is slightly different in that this is, the, the, the rationale here is that while well, Peter gave me this money, he clearly expects some of it back. And if I don't give him money back, I'm letting him down, right? And I'll feel guilty, I'll feel bad about that. So these are slightly different explanations. But one problem with these explanations is that it's very difficult to actually distinguish between them, as I'll show in a second, purely from looking at people's behavior. A secondary point, but maybe one that's more important, is it's also possible that different people can have different moral principles. And perhaps this is very clear in political science, but it's often very unclear in psychology and economics, where we kind of like to think there's the one, uh, the one true model of people's behavior and that people more or less fit this model. And so a typical experiment would be, we're going to compare equity to expectation, whichever is the best predictor, we say this is the model of reciprocation. But of course, we know that different people have different moral principles about a whole bunch of things. So why wouldn't they have it about reciprocity? So we set out to, uh, to test this in a series of studies. I'll, I'll show you just one study and just some quickly some data where we tried to see, can we, uh, can we understand what the specific motivations of specific people are? And so the way we did this is we changed the trust game a little. So this is the standard trust game. I just, I just showed you this a second ago. Um, and the, the, the two explanations of expectation and equity kind of go as follows. If you're an expectation follower, you look at what Peter, uh, Peter thinks you have 32. You'll try and put yourself in the mindset of Peter. You'll think Peter probably expects back about half and you'll return 16 because you think that's what he expects. And it turns out that actually is what he expects. An equity follower alternately will look at what I have. I have 32 euro and well, it's just fair to split that. So I'm gonna split it 16 and 16. I don't really care what Peter thinks. This is just my moral rule, moral principle. Um, and as you can see from the bottom of the screen here, it's slightly problematic in that both of these models predict the same thing. So what we've done is change the game slightly so that um, the different models make different predictions, and then we can see which fits behavior better. So we call this the hidden multiplier trust game, and it goes as follows. The beginning of the game is, is as I mentioned, Peter has eight, or sorry, Peter has 10. He gives you eight. We tell Peter the multiplier is four. So Peter believes you're going to have 32. But we pull a sneaky trick here and we actually multiply the money by six. So you have 48, but Peter believes you have 32. OK, so now we have a situation where the two uh, motivations actually make different predictions because they rely on these two different uh, beliefs. So the um, expectation follower, the logic is he should think, well, Peter believes I have 32. So Peter expects back 16. So I'm just going to give Peter 16. And he'll be happy. I'll pocket the extra. Everyone's a winner here, okay? Especially me. So that's the explanation, what, what, what we would think an expectation follower did. So if a participant returned 16 here, we could kind of type uh, him or her as an expectation follower. Alternately, we would expect the equity follower to say, well, you know what? I actually have 48. It doesn't really matter what Peter believes. I have 48, and it's right just to split that. So I'm going to return Peter 
uh, 24, you know, plus or minus a little bit. So again, if, if, if our participant does this, we're going to type this person as an equity follower. Now, you might be thinking, well, it seems to be better to be an expectation follower here than an equity follower, right? You make eight euro more per trial. So perhaps I'll just choose to be an expectation follower. So to avoid this happening, we have another set of trials where, again, Peter believes you have 32, but now we only multiply that money by two. And so you only actually have 16. So now, um, if you're an expectation follower, you'll still return 16 because that's half of what uh, Peter believes you to have. So expect expectation followers, you have to give up all of their money, whereas equity followers, uh, you only give up half your money. So we try and make it so one strategy isn't objectively better than others. And so what we find here in this, um, I'm not going to go through the math in this model, but we have a, a model to, to try to quantify these motivations. Um, and what we have is this somewhat complex graph, but I'll, I'll uh, step through the important parts. What we can essentially do is each of these little symbols represents a participant in our study. And we can essentially type them based on their model parameters, which is essentially based on their data. Okay, So we have these group of subjects here who look like equity followers. They tend to give half of whatever they have, irrespective of what Peter believes. We have this group of subjects here who look like expectation followers. That is, they always give Peter what they believe he expects, irrespective of what they actually have. Uh, there's always a few subjects who just take all the money and run. This is inevitable consequence of living in a society. There are just these people around, and you should try and avoid them, but um, uh, they exist. So there's always five people who just say, thanks, Peter, and run away. And then we have this interesting group of people here who are we call moral opportunists. And these are people who, when confronted with this situation, sorry, I'm just going back here. When confronted with this situation, decide to be expectation followers. And when confronted with this situation, they decide to be equity followers. So we call them moral opportunists because they're doing something moral, right? They're different from these greedy folk here, but they have this kind of flexible moral rule that they apply depending on what's best for them at any given moment. And I think if we all... Uh, look into our heart. There's many, op, op, many situations when we are moral opportunists. We want to do the right thing, but we want to do the, the, the best right thing for us. And the second part of this study, um, I'll just briefly mention is that while people were doing all this, they were in uh, MRI machine. So we can also look at the kind of neural correlates of these particular moral strategies. And what we, oh, sorry, there's one extra thing. Um, we were also interested in the, the, the degree to which these, these, strategy proportions uh, are these just some you know phenomenon of our you know 36 subjects or are they somewhat more robust so we've so subsequently done this experiment with multiple different groups these are three different groups across three slightly different variants of the experiment and one interesting thing we find is that the strategy distribution across our participant sample stays pretty much the same even when we change people we change the design a little bit most people are the model is moral opportunists. Uh, there's a large group of inequity averse people and there's fewer greedy or a guilt averse or expectation. That's something suggestive for us that we're working on some uh, agent based simulations to see, is there some stability with these proportions? Is it best for society if most people are moral opportunists, but there's a few people in there who are sticking to these harder core rules. And as I mentioned, we can also look at these strategies in the brain. And what we find is that these different decision strategies seem to be computed across different brain regions. So people who are what we would call equity followers, so they're you know, dividing half of the money. They have a unique brain pattern in areas like the medial prefrontal cortex here, um, as well as some other areas. But this is distinct from people who are expectation followers, people who are trying to figure out what Peter wants and give them that. Um, here we have unique brain patterns in different areas like the anterior insulin. I can talk at the end about why this is interesting in this uh, context. And when we look at these moral opportunists, we wondered what their brains would look like. And it turns out their brains shift, just like we might expect. So when they're making uh, equity choices, their brains look like equity followers. And when they're making expectation choices, their brains are look like expectation followers. So they seem to have a strategic ability to kind of shift these brain representations as a function of what's best. So I wanted just to give that uh, experimental example to show again, the, the type of questions we ask, the kind of methods we use, namely these economic games and the, 
what we can glean from combinations of behavioral uh, testing, com computational modeling, and uh, the brain, brain uh, data. So I'll talk just briefly now about this, as I said, very fresh data on this political uh, neuroscience question, which hopefully was of interest. Um, so here we were, this is work with uh, Elisa van der Plas, who was a, a PhD student in London and really drove this study in collaboration with myself and Martin and Hido. Um, and what we were interested in here in this study was looking at the, what are the behavioral and brain consequences of framing political debates? So political simplification frames. And the two frames we were most interested in here were one is a threat frame. So there's a particular societal problem and you emphasize the problem's consequences, okay? So, you know, here's this quote from Obama here, climate change is no longer a far problem. It's happening here, it's happening now. So this is essentially a fear frame. We try and make people afraid of the issue by showing its large negative consequences. We're also interested in a separate frame, a blame frame. So now not emphasizing the problem's consequences, but emphasizing the problem's cause, right? So who can we point the finger at and that has caused this problem, right? Whether it's immigration or climate change. So that's what we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at what happens when we, we give people a, a social problem uh, and we frame it in different ways. So what happens both behaviorally, what, do, what are people want to do with that information? And most importantly here, what happens in people's brains? So does framing, the debate in certain ways lead to certain systematic shifts in people's brain activity. So this is a, a part of a broader scale project. Um, so we're kind of conducting these three studies somewhat in, uh, in concert. So uh, we've done one large scale general population sample of nearly 2000 participants where we give people these societal problems with this framing and we look and we ask about their attitudes about it. And we have a separate study where we look at EEG so for those of you who don't know, this is an EEG cap where we can pick up very small uh, signals in electrical signals in the brain um, and be able to assess, broadly speaking, where these signals are coming from at any given uh, moment in time. And the study I'll talk to you about now is an fMRI study, right? So we, we strap people to a gurney here. We put them in this large, very large, very powerful magnet, and we're able to pick up very small differences in magnetic uh, signal between essentially parts of the brain that are active versus parts of the brain that aren't. It's a gross simplification, but um, that's the basic uh, thing we're trying to do. So we'll talk about the fMRI study here now. So we did this on 31 participants, and here we're interested in what are these brain effects of these different types of framing. So this was inspired a little bit by some previous work on uh, political polarization. And this is a study uh, amongst you is, is Jeroen van Barr, who I mentioned as the previous author. Um, his lab, the great did his postdoc, were very interested in political issues. And they did this study. And in this study, they, they, they took two groups of participants. They took people who identified as strongly liberal, and they took people who identified as strongly conservative in the US, so essentially Republicans and Democrats. They had each of these participants watch uh, 35 minutes of video clips. Um, so they watched this documentary on BBC Earth. And you can think of this as a kind of the control. We shouldn't necessarily see differences in the brains of Republicans and conservatives when they're watching um, uh, nature documentaries. You might argue the Republicans are looking at how can we dig for oil in these places and so on. But I think Broadly speaking, this is a control. And what they were really interested in was this last 17 minutes here. So what happens in the brains of these two groups when they're watching a political debate? And um, this is the, I think the vice presidential debate for the last, uh, or maybe the election before last in the US. And so, so what they did was they simply looked at the brain signal across this whole time window. And they look to see what happened to the different type of brains. And what, the, what many things happen, what the interesting thing that happens is the brains kind of polarized. That is the liberal brains looked very similar to each other, but different from the conservative brains who looked similar to each other, but different from the liberal brains. And I don't know if you can see this there, but these two lower lines are our two conservatives. And in, at this point in time, you know, they're largely look similar here. Then the political stuff starts the two uh, Republican brains look quite similar in this direction. The two liberal brains look quite similar in this direction. 
you have to squint a little bit to uh, to get the point but of course you can statistically test all this and look to see what degree there's synchrony in the brain as a function of uh, political polarization so there seems to be evidence here for neural polarization in a particular part of the brain and that's this part of the brain here this is the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex which is particularly important for like attitude formation and uh, concepts like that so it's not a, it's not happening in a random part of the brain it's in a rather specific part of the brain so we got interested in, in looking at well what happens when you don't take uh, two pre-existing groups but you give uh, different types of framing to non-partisan uh, people and so that's what we tried to do in uh, in our study so we looked at the question of does political framing via these uh, threat and brain flame brain lame frames it's hard to say i mentioned does political framing lead to either behavioral or neural polarization in a set of non-partisan recipients so in your um, average dutch university student who are you know a little bit left of center but uh, at least the ones we found are fairly homogenous in their political beliefs so uh, that's what we did and so the way we went about that now there of course a lot of constraints to fMRI studies because people are lying inside this magnet. They're largely immobilized. Um, their head is sometimes likely taped to uh, the surroundings so they can't move it. They respond with buttons on each finger. Um, so, you know, we have to make allowances for the design. But so this is what the design looked like. So we had uh, three societal issues that we used. So we used climate change, healthcare, and immigration. And we had a short video clip from uh, Dutch TV um, on each of these issues. And what we did was we overlaid narration and subtitles um, according to our three different framing conditions. So we had our uh, condition A is essentially our baseline uh, condition uh, where we're relatively neutral about threat and blame. And it's kind of just baseline factual information, right? So it could be that the Netherlands will get wet feet around 2100. I think that probably translates better into Dutch than it sounds in English. So uh, but this was all in, uh, in, oh, it's there in Dutch as well, yeah. Um, the second frame we used was a threat frame. So here we tried again to uh, get people thinking about the consequences. So ocean levels will rise so quickly, large parts of the Netherlands will flood. Okay, again, they're seeing the same video content. The only thing that's different is the, uh, the text and narration they hear. And in the final frame, the blame frame, we try and point the finger. And here it's politicians are cowards and fail to think in the long term. OK, so each participant is going to see uh, one social issue with a baseline uncertainty, one social issue with threat and one social issue with blame. So they see all three video clips of all three social issues and we just counterbalance the, the type of framing they, they see. I should point out that before the experiment, we asked them, what's your attitude towards climate change, immigration, and, um, and healthcare, and people are broadly similar. So we don't see big pre-existing differences, which is what we want from this kind of non-partisan uh, audience. And so the way the experiment works is, um, they watch these video clips, uh, these three, sorry, they watch one video clip, then they're asked, would you like to share this uh, on YouTube? And so we use that as an index of people's willingness to disseminate the information they've just received. Then we get them a, a measure of emotions. This is the, the PANAS, which is a, a fairly well, widely used um, psychological scale for uh, basic emotions. So we simply ask them on a slider, do you feel anxiety, fear, worry, anger, frustration, fury? And we get a, a rating between zero and 100. Um, two of these, fear or worry, we, we, we consider kind of a composite measure of fear. And two, anger and frustration, we use as the composite measure for anger. And then finally, we ask them the question, how important do you think this issue is? Again, on a scale from zero to 100. Then they go back and watch the second video clip, do the sharing, blah, 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 so on, so on, so forth. So that's what the participants actually experience. So what do we see? So what do we see um, in their behavior? So here, behavior, we're looking at the emotions they feel and their willingness to share this content and their idea of how important the issue is. So what do these two frames, threat and blame, what do they do to these behavioral measures? So in terms of the emotion, um, this is in a sense a, a manipulation check that indeed we find that simplification frames do indeed increase negative emotion. So what I'm showing you here is the appraisal condition of threat on the left and blame on the right. And I'm showing you their scores of fear and anger. 
Um, so this is anger. This is fear compared to the baseline condition of, uh, of, of neutral uncertainty. Okay. So this is the kind of extra anger and fear they feel as a function of the appraisal condition. So um, everything's above zero. So they're, they're, they're feeling more emotion, which is kind of what we intended. Interestingly, um, the blame really triggers anger. Um, the threat doesn't trigger as much fear as we hoped. Um, so maybe we have to really scare them. Um, uh, but uh, it did, you know, it does have a higher fear than the blame condition. So blame works really nicely that it doesn't make them very afraid, but it does make them very angry. Threat seems to kind of merge these two somewhat, which uh, we're going to think about when we kind of get into our more sophisticated analyses. And in terms of their behavior, um, oops, that didn't work. Okay. In terms of their behavior, uh, what I'm showing you here is again the two appraisal conditions, threat and blame. Um, if we look at the 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 whatever color that is, dot the, the sharing, we can see that, and again, zero here is what they do in the in the in the baseline case. So you can see that um, both appraisal conditions increase willingness to share, but more so in threat than blame. So when they see this threat frame, they're more likely to say, yes, I want to uh, disseminate this information than in the blame frame. But again, both above baseline. Uh, but interestingly, the importance actually drops. So um, the importance drops at about an equal rate in the two conditions, threat and blame. But you know, we could debate about whether that's really interestingly different from zero or not. I personally don't think so, but um, we have some lively debates in our group about that. But, but certainly the sharing, it does increase sharing. So this, uh, these simplification frames do change decision-making in a, in a very real way. And finally, how about the brain? So the way we're going to do this is in similar to the previous, um, uh, the, the previous experiment on, on neuropolarization. Essentially, what we're looking for is how well the, the subject's brains correlate with each other. Okay, And if subject's brains, we would kind of expect largely subject's brains to correlate with each other when they're watching the same content. That's usually what we find if we have you know, every one of us here are watching the same movie, we'll find large correlations between our brain activity over time uh, in specific areas. And that's what we, we, we would predict this kind of synchrony amongst our brains. And so what we wondered then was what's the difference between neural synchrony in the neutral condition than when in these framing conditions. So are these framing conditions driving differences in neural synchrony? And that's exactly what they seem to do. So we find more synchronization in the control frame than for the simplification frame. So even though they're watching the same visual content, um, when, when we're all watching the control frame, our brains tend to look alike, but when we're watching these simplification frames, we tend to get these differences, okay? And at least in, and we also see it here, if you can see my cursor here, in this dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, which is uh, this area that's been, been found before. And there's some very preliminary uh, data showing that Within our nonpartisan group, of course, there are people who have tendencies and, and people who have tendencies more extreme. So, for example, people who are more sympathetic to PVV, um, they tend to be more asynchronous than even uh, everybody else. And they also tend to be synchronous with each other, but only in the blame frame. So um, we might have this interesting case where, depending on the frame, it might kind of separate out people with kind of pre-existing political views but what we think we've at least shown with this is that it's possible to induce this kind of neural polarization even in relatively non-partisan uh, groups uh, as a function of these different kinds of framing so again this is all caveated by saying you know i just uh, received this slide uh, two days ago so this is something we're really actively working on these are extremely complex uh, data analyses with vast amounts of data so there's a lot of questions for us to answer and um, there's regions in here i've just listed a few um, but I mean, you've probably heard of the amygdala which is a kind of a threat center so there's regions in here which would make good sense um, and would be, I think, are really interesting to, to do, do a deeper dive on um, as we, we go forward with this. So I think I'll just summarize here and then we can have a chat. So what I've tried to show you, I, I hope, is the importance of combining fundamental research and important societal questions. And I think that's something that hasn't been done enough from fundamental researchers. So I think uh, we're really seeking, or hopefully seeking to branch out and see, can we start addressing important questions that have both a, a fundamental, but also an applied component to them. Um, 
What I tried to also show is the breadth of decision neuroscience. So we use a lot of methods. Uh, we try and collaborate with as many people as possible um, from a lot of different uh, uh, fields. It's been a really interesting collaboration with uh, the political scientists. Um, we both, you know, it takes like five meetings for you to realize you're speaking about the same things and using just completely different terms. Uh, once you get past that, it, it goes quite well. Um, but I think uh, every field has its own set of, you know, theories and tools and, and um, but it's possible with some work to, to move past that. And I think really generate interesting new questions. Um, you know, this is similar that when we try and understand decision making, we really want to take a variety of approaches. We, we want to understand the psychology, the neuroscience. We want to formalize it with models and we want to perturb it with hormones or various other approaches. So that's, I think, a really important um, characteristic of, of the work we do. And I do think it has this potential usefulness in informing policy issues. So we've recently set up a, a center for decision science here at uh, Radboud, uh, where we're really trying to link with uh, policy people in Den Haag and, and elsewhere to try and, you know, help them formulate these large scale policies, which involve either individual decisions or group decisions, and try and understand how a, a better um, appreciation of the mechanisms can actually help us design better policy. And so that's kind of the goal of our uh, Radboud Center for Decision Science and our lab. And I will thank you all for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Alan. This is uh, very interesting. Um, for the people who are new, uh, you can uh, type your questions and comments in the box, the Q&A box below. Um, in the meantime, while you're writing, uh, I will uh, abuse my position as a moderator to ask a, ask a question. Um, Alan, I was, I was wondering, you, um, you uh, mentioned or you, you, you discussed the blame frame and the threat frame. And I was thinking while reading it, aren't they uh, closely correlated with certain ideologies or personality traits? Um, and my question would be, also, would that matter? Because I, I could imagine, for instance, that people who are radical in general, that they would be more susceptible to the uh, blame frame compared to the other frames, while the threat frame, for instance, would be, well, many people, more people maybe would be susceptible to that kind of frame. Um, have you thought about that? Have you look, looked into that? And does it matter? I'm not really sure about that. Yeah, I think, well, it's a good question. And I think, uh, well, to be honest, you're in a better position to say whether it matters than me, uh, a novice in this. But um, we, we, I mean, I think you're right. I think certainly these different types of framing are different people are going to be more susceptible. And that could be, you know, you could think about that in terms of political ideology. Uh, I imagine more radical people are going to be more um enraged for example and susceptible to the blame frame you could also think in terms of you know psychological uh, difference right people who are maybe more anxious or uh, might be more sensitive to a threat frame so i certainly think um, there's going to be individual differences in how these frames work what we tried to do here at least in the first pass was have as kind of as homogenous a group as possible so we we kind of screened out anyone who seemed to have uh, radical views, at least radical political views, kind of either right or left. Um, and, and we try to look at that. Now, I think it will be very interesting to actually explore, A, to explore, well, there's two things I think would be interesting. One, that we do a deeper dive into our demographics of our participants and see, are there differences in there which we could exploit to look at differences in, say, neural synchronization, right? So is it the case that the people who are even on the right of our relatively centrist group are they a lot more susceptible as i mentioned i think that seems to be the case with those you know handful of pvv um sympathizers um so that would be one thing we could do um but a second thing could also be actually look at this in a more radical um population or sample and see you know, we, we would predict you would get indeed much more uh polariz neural polarization so if you got a group of kind of right wing versus left wing people you would see this clear separation that uh, they saw in that um, in that U.S. study, Republic, Republicans and conservatives. To me, again, as a novice, and I don't know whether this is more interesting, uh, but to me, it seems interesting to look at those large, massive, undifferentiated people, undifferentiated people in the middle, and look at kind of what might press buttons there. So, what are particular frames that would drive this, and we can kind of use the brain essentially as a readout then of of, of some at least some element of polarization which could be interesting. So it's Thank a lot you. of problem and an opportunity, I think. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks, as so often it is, yes. right? <laughs> Christian uh, has a question. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. That was super interesting. Um, I have a very similar question that Matthias just had about the, the first part of your presentation. Um, do you have any info on are there some social demographic predictors on if you are an expectation follower, an equity follower, or how, if you're one of these more strategic persons? Yeah, no, um, I would love to say yes, but sadly, no. So we, that's something we haven't looked at, but we are looking at now because it would be, you know, it's one nice thing to say these people separate out, but. Um, of course, it's the next question is why. So what's different about these people, if anything? I mean, one thing we've done is, it doesn't really answer your question, but it goes some way towards it. We've looked at uh, behavior in other types of economic games where we can kind of construct the games to have a similar kind of outcomes. And we find that at least people are internally consistent. So that if they tend to be expectation follower in game A, uh, at time point A, we bring them back and have them play game B at time point B, they tend to look the same. So um, that gives us some confidence. There's something there might be something there. Right? It's not just some small scale contextual effect. Um, what it would be. And I think this is where we, we reach the limits of our lab studies. And we really have to start thinking about research in a different way, because, you know, we, we, if we're doing these uh, fMRI studies, they're extremely labor and economically uh, costly. So, you know, we, we study, you know, 50, 60 people is a really big study. So we don't have a huge range there of these interesting individual variables. Um, and also we tend to recruit from the people who happen to be walking past their offices, which are, you know, Dutch undergraduate students. And uh, what we're trying to do as part of this uh, Radboud Center that I mentioned is really uh, broaden out into the community and, and look at a richer set of um, participants that vary across a lot, lot of different dimensions. And I think that gives us a bit more leverage to see what you're to, to be able to answer your question as to what might be the kind of underlying psychological or demographic or socioeconomic characteristics that allow these people to uh, separate out. I mean, we do, we do basic stuff. So, you know, we have people's basic attitudes towards uh, inequality and we have, kind of, you know, age, gender and so on. So there's nothing in there that's an obvious predictor, but I think that would be the next step for us to start to dive a bit deeper and, and think about what could, what could be a useful predictive, um, predictive uh, variables there. Thank you, uh, Alan. I have a question by Melissa Baker, um, somewhat related to the first question about individual differences. Participants were described as non-partisans. What does this mean? The label makes me think people who aren't interested in or don't know anything about politics. But the way they were described makes me, th makes me think they're either co-partisans, so they're just very similar in partisanship, or relatively moderate. I imagine this distinction is important for interpreting the ROI results. Curious to uh, hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so yeah, again, as, as we've seen, we quickly reached the limits of my expertise on these topics. So I mean, as but I understand there's probably a difference between nonpartisans, co-partisans and moderates. Um, my, and so apologies if I misspoke and uh, abused these terms. Um, my sense uh, is that they're more moderates. So they, they're, I don't think they're disengaged um, or don't care um, because when we asked them before the uh, study about, you know, do you think these issues are important? People respond that they're important. Now, you know, somebody's there telling, asking you, is this issue important? Of course, there's some demand characteristics there and people might, uh, might want to appear more engaged than they are. But my sense is that they're the more moderates. So um, that, I guess that's what I specifically mean by nonpartisans and that they're kind of in the, in the center, I think with a slight bias to the left. But um, I, I think we do ask them kind of what Dutch political party do you most um, identify with? And they're mostly these kind of centrists many centrist parties, which I cannot list off the top of my head. Um, so that would be, I think, what we mean by them. But I imagine it would be quite interesting to look at uh, the idea of non-partisans versus moderates. So what, how, you know, are people who just are relatively less engaged in these issues? Are they, you know, are they harder or easier to, to frame with these messages? I don't know. And I don't know whether you guys study these things the difference between these political groups? Thanks. Um, Gijs, you had a question as well. Yeah, uh, hi, Ellen. I'm all the way in the back. Yeah, you're like... I see uh, myself, yeah, actually. Even, 
this picture. Okay, uh, I think the answer to your question uh, that you asked us was yes, but, the, but the, let's talk about your research first. Okay. That, was a, that was a succinct answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to get to understand neuroscience more. So uh, we, have, we were speaking to a couple of neuroscientists in, uh, in our faculty, and, and they, they, uh, they are talking about neural mapping, and you're talking about neural synchronization. I'm not sure what both these concepts are, so I'm hoping that you can help me there. Well, they're related. So, I mean, neural mapping is kind of the, I guess, the canonical way we, we've been doing um, uh, brain imaging, right? Whether it's fMRI or PET or EEG. And essentially, you, know, you have people do a task and you try and assess where in the brain the, the kind of the magic is happening, right? So you get them to do a task and you have them do a control task. And you hope that the difference between these two tasks is your um, process of interest, right? So you have them look at a, a nice visual scene and then you have them look at a nice visual scene where they have to detect something. And if you compare the brain activations in both of these uh, conditions, uh, you hope to see something different. And that's kind of brain mapping right there. We might see that, you know, attention cortex is active when you're doing the detection versus when you're not so that's essentially brain mapping and you know we can do that of course you know it's just all the data just comes in so we can do that too so we can look and see for example are there particular areas that are more active when they see the threat frame than the blame frame and we could do that and um, what's difficult about that in the context of error stimuli is that we have these kind of minutes long video stimuli and so usually we don't have like a discrete event. So if I gave you a decision, right? If I give you this trust game decision, I can say, okay, you have 32 euro, what do you wanna do? And you press a button and then we can kind of tie your decision-making process to the associated time point in our, in our brain data. We don't have that with this video stream. And so more what we're interested in is saying, do people seem to be processing the information in a similar or a different way? Now, we could divide up that video into all these discrete time points and say, okay, now when the guy on the left is speaking, is there differences? How about now when the guy on the right is speaking? So but we've taken this other approach, which is this basically inter-brain synchronous, inter-subject uh, synchronization, where we simply look and see, are our brains active in the same way uh, temporally? So across time, when we're watching the video, are our brains kind of active in a, in a similar synchronized way or not? So, I mean, it's just a different way of, of mapping the correlations of the brain um, activity. We're now looking at correlations with each other as opposed to correlations with the stimulus itself. Um, but we can still do those kind of analyses. It's just, it, it's not really suitable for um, an experiment like this where there aren't a whole bunch of events happening. And most of our experiments have events because that that's what we're interested in. So th this, this analysis that I told you about in the second part, um, that's more of a, that's quite a new way of thinking about um, people, um, yeah, assessing and interpreting stimuli in a kind of a continuous uh, time frame. I hope that helped a little bit. It was a lot less succinct than your answer, so, but I hope it still uh, serves some purpose. Thanks. Thanks. I have um, one more question. Um, you sh when you showed how, what respondents saw, right, you, you started with the, uh, with the, uh, th no, with the fear uh, uh, frame and then the blame frame, right? So my, my question basically is, was this the order or, or was that random? Because I can imagine that yeah. blame comes after fear and that, that could have consequences when you do sure, the other way yeah. around. No, that was counterbalanced across participants. So each, each participant saw a fixed order, but that order changed across participants. So we had the same number of orderings. Now, would actually, that's something we haven't done yet, but that um, your point raises, I think, a good question. It would also be interesting to look at those carryover effects, right? Because we can do that. We can look, for example, at all the participants' first video when they come to this, you know, unknown uh, versus whether by the time you get to the last video and you've seen all these different opinions, um, does that make your, your brain noisier or, or less noisy? So um, we, we plan indeed to look at that uh, as part of the analysis. But the data I just showed you here was everything combined, um, but with this counterbalanced aspect to it. Thanks. Christian. Um, I would have a very uh, general question about uh, doing this kind of research. Um, since you're working with so if this very low number of participants with work with fMRI, for instance, how does it work in general then to draw sound conclusions from, from, from these small samples and not running into the risk of just finding something at, at, by chance? And yeah. 
So um, we make up for our small samples by collecting lots and lots of data from them. So, you know, we typically have a lot of trials per participant. Um, so we try and oversample that way. Uh, I'm happy to say fMRI studies are, are you know, getting bigger. Um, there's a kind of, well, you don't need to hear a whole uh, when, back in my day, but back in my day, um, you know, and fMRI studies were like 12 people and that was, that was fine. And now that's, uh, we're, we're a long way from that. So you're looking at kind of 40 to 50 as, as minimum numbers. And, you know, for something like the study we did, we, we, I would have liked to do much more. And um, we had some, uh, you know, personnel constraints, but, um, you know, that's basically the answer is that we, we, we oversample our participants a lot. Um, and we're, I think the, the, there has been an issue with fMRI that I think the, the statistical interpretation hasn't been as rigorous as it, as it could have been. But that's, I think, improving a lot now. There's other kind of analyses like the one I mentioned. And just as a greater awareness that we have to be uh, a bit more, um, yeah, we have to be a bit more careful because of our relatively low samples. I mean, of course, we always also try and build upon. So, for example, in the Van Bar study I showed, um, they found this dorsomedial prefrontal cortex as an important part of this uh, political polarization, neural polarization. If we hadn't found that, that would, you know, cause me to think to, to, that would throw those results into question as well as our own results. The fact that we can at least replicate brain areas across studies gives us a little bit more uh, confidence too. But for sure, it's very different from the type of uh, uh, research I think you guys are used to doing kind of a large, large panels. Um, and so the fact that we, we ran the large panel um, before and our behavior results look quite similar, that also gives us some confidence that just the fact that we have a small sample and more importantly, the fact that they're in an MRI machine is a very weird environment. We always like to replicate our behavioral results so that we're not just getting, um, you know, claustrophobic effects, um, which would be not good. Thank this you. quite claustrophobic. <laughs> thanks. Uh, Beth also has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. This is uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so, uh, many questions, but but I, I have one up about, uh, could you s uh, say a little bit about how you how the results of the population-based uh, survey experiments are going to uh, align with these with this fMRI work? So so are you what's the how are you drawing that parallel, uh, given that the, the sample that you have in the fMRI is a relatively uh, uh, apart from being a convenient sample, is a, a sample that is moderate, right? So are you subsetting the moderates from the pan, from the population and look at, at that synchron at, at the parallels there? Or so, yeah. so that's yeah, just I mean, curious that's, how, you, how you imagine how, how you do this sort of this sort of complete two very different types yeah. of studies in one paper. Sure. Um well we probably won't do it in one paper. Okay. Uh, short answer there. Um, <laughs> The more interesting answer is um, that yeah we will indeed look at those look at those people in the population sample that were as close as possible demographically to the people we tested in the imaging and that's to, again to give us confidence that we're not getting some weird lab effects right you know um, because we're very conscious that, that that could be the case and and then I guess I view the fMRI as a potential insight into the mechanisms right the behavior is the behavior and in a sense that's the interesting thing right and I could see why. Um, political scientists or economists think, well, you know, I'm sure it happens in here somewhere, whether it happens here or here is, is irrelevant to me. So, but we're, we're particularly interested in the mechanisms. And so I think that's what mm -hmm. fMRI allows us to start to think about, you know, what is it that, for example, this particular frame, you know, drives people to be more partisan. And it could be this simple, this, uh, you know, decoupling of neural signals. And then we could potentially get into looking at where this is decoupled and when, and that gives us a bit more granularity in these uh, kind of behavioral processes. I, I, I do might have a suggestion of do combining the two studies. Uh, if, if it, because uh, one thing that I also uh, myself in some of my own work have suffered from is that we focus a lot on the extremes, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we start with like society is massively polarized and how can we understand all that? But yeah. if we look at the distribution of, uh, of, of people's beliefs, actually many people are relatively moderate, right? And uh, if you have to just walk through a random neighborhood and talk at a schoolyard to some people and most people are like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah I see the benefits of immigration. I also see the downsides, you know, I, I'm climate change matters, but I also, you know, it's also complicated. So I, 
I, I do think there's some sort of a blind spot in, in a lot of social scientists that we that we may be driven by some sort of media uh, uh, climate think that we should always study the extremes. Mm. But so if you can show in the population based study that the treatment effects of threat and blame are very different for the moderate compared to the people on the extremes, that would also make a, a, a more interesting a really interesting case to study the mechanism mm -hmm. among these moderates that yeah. that there was a sort of a suggestion that i yeah. that i had to to uh to make that case that hey it's actually really interesting because that's maybe also where we get the most movement in the population when because you know we know that people at extremes are just really hard to move in any direction yeah in that's a really helpful suggestion thanks i, I kind of like that idea also of focusing on um the moderates, I can see, you know, why it's maybe more boring. It's, it's always good to talk to these lunatics at either end, right? That's a bit more interesting. Uh, but I mean, the moderates are probably where the majority is, and uh, getting some insight into how, how they are shifted and the mechanisms will be will be really in. So that's a really nice idea to think about using that population sample to show that these people are different, qualitatively different um, at either extreme, maybe. Yeah, and I don't know how decision science looks at this, but at least sort of the political science work on on says that like the people that have the strongest attitudes are the most extreme are the hardest to move in any direction yeah. uh, if anything you push them the wrong uh, make them more convinced of their own yeah. positions it's the people in the in in the middle that's where we can do more uh, where we where we might be able to actually push people in certain directions right. so yeah that's a good motivation yeah that's a very good suggestion thank you i think uh, beth um we're out of time now. Yeah, so, so uh, I'm I'll, giving the floor back to you. Yeah, I'll uh, wrap it up. Um, uh, so, uh, Alan, thanks. This is uh, this is a super uh, super interesting and I uh, uh, really interesting work. Uh, uh, both projects that you presented, and I hope uh, uh, that that at some point in the future we uh, we can uh, we can interact a little bit more on uh, on these and related topics. Uh, Last few minutes, just a couple of announcements. Uh, we have a couple of really interesting speakers coming up. Next week, we have Gieselin de Kuipers from the University of Leuven, who will give a talk on humor and polarization, how humor can uh, drive people apart in politics and beyond. On November 12th, we have Hannah Nam from Stony Brook University uh, with a talk titled Regulate the Economy or My Emotions, Exploring the Role of Emotions in Economic Equality. On November 19th, we have a longer meeting. It's the Dutch political psychology meeting that uh, Mike Homan, uh, Janneke van der Toorn uh, from Utrecht University, uh, Ruf Pliskin from Leiden University and myself organize uh, uh, together with the Hot Politics Lab. Uh, and uh, uh, speakers uh, are uh, Mike Homan, uh, Jamie Settle from William & Mary and a third speaker who I forget, uh, sorry for that. And uh, uh, November 26, we have Christian Pipal and Matthijs Gillensen uh, giving talks on their uh, respective dissertation work. Uh, and uh, December 3, we end the year with a talk by Leonie Huddy uh, 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 titled uh, Nationalism and Party Politics. So uh, as you can see, pretty diverse set of speakers. I think a really exciting uh, set of speakers. So I hope that we'll see uh, you all either in person in Amsterdam or in the hybrid Zoom environments. Uh, but um, it's uh, 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 it's always a pleasure for me uh, to uh, to attend uh, and uh, that we can have all these interesting guests. So, Alan, thanks for uh, making the time on this Friday. Yeah, afternoon. thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. And, uh...